Hello and welcome to TARDIS Rubbish, the podcast where our rubbish opinions about Doctor Who just can't be contained, even though our brains are bigger on the inside. I am Josh, and joining me today to discuss the second of the 60th anniversary specials is returning guest, John. Delighted to be here. And introducing longtime Doctor Who fan and longtime friend, Guy. Hello, everybody. Good to be here. Guy acted in a show that I made an embarrassingly long time ago, and um, we bonded over our mutual love of Doctor Who. Uh, Guy, do you remember when we were guests at um, Icon 31, the convention? And oh, met- yeah. Yeah, yeah. Here in uh, out, out east. Yeah, and uh, Paul McGann was there, and we met him. I met him? Or did you meet him? I remember meeting him and being completely plastered in Chicago at a convention. And I think I might have blocked that out because I'm so embarrassed. So embarrassed. Okay, well, I met him. I know you, that I met him at Icon You 31. met him. Yeah. Yes. No, I met Daphne fun. Ashbrook there. Yeah, she was the other guest there. Yeah, right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Lovely well, woman. Lovely woman. Made her cry, actually. Was, not that I'm, I'm not proud cry? of that. I just told her, I told her how, what her role of, uh, as Grace Holloway meant to, to me and how beautiful she looked as she, in that slow motion sequence when she's running down the hall in her 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 gown she's just running in slow motion her bosoms are like just bouncing up and down i'm like as a gay man i was like this is really doing something to me this is really beautiful anyway so we just got to talking a little bit more and she just cried a little bit i have what she said to me uh, on the wall but oh, we can get lovely. into that later you can edit to edit no, that well, out <laughs> well the tv movie has a special place in my heart um because Literally, my first Doctor was Paul McGann, because the first Doctor Who I ever watched was the TV movie in 1996. And it was the last Doctor Who that I watched for for almost 10 years, because it was so impenetrable with the, like, lore that you needed to know. Like, I think, (laughs) um, you know, this has been commented on in many other places, so I won't get too deeply into it. But one of the brilliant things Russell T. Davies did when he brought Doctor Who back with Christopher Eccleston and Rose is that he treated it like it was a brand new thing that you didn't need to know anything about. And that was the exact opposite approach of the TV movie where Mm -hmm. you had to know they start with one doctor and he regenerates and becomes this other doctor. And you're like, what is going on here? So it's 30 minutes into the movie before you're even following the character who you're going to be following without knowing the concept of regeneration or who the master is or what is going on. It's just all very, it's just a lot and it takes Mm -hmm. a long time to get going. And so, yeah, so the TV movie was the first Doctor Who that I really, you know, intentionally sat down and watched. I remembered sitting down to watch it because from Star Trek conventions and stuff in the early nineties, I was familiar with Doctor Who from, you know, the dealer's rooms and you see all of the Doctor Who memorabilia and stuff so i was familiar with it and when they were doing this new tv movie i was like oh okay here's an opportunity to maybe finally check this thing out and see what it's about and it really didn't grab me at all and something similar happened (laughs) almost 10 years later with the russell t davies reboot and that time it got me so that's a long yeah i never quite thought of it that way as being and some people that didn't know Doctor Who that I had a Doctor Who viewing party that night um, were very confused by this. Why is that box spinning through space? What is that? And all of a sudden they were in this living, this really large living room. I'm like, no, 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 that 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 living room is inside that box. And uh, and I was like, oh, see, as a person that knew it, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm, they got me. But everybody else, it, it was very jarring. Jarring. I love the TV movie. Absolutely adore the TV movie. But uh, we're not here to talk about that. Um, we are not. And and you want to know my favorite doctor? Yes. Yes. Who is your doctor, guy? Peter Davidson. Davidson. Why did I say David? Peter Davidson. Davidson. Wow. Yes. Yeah. I I grew up. I my my older brother actually found Doctor Who when I was eleven. I immediately saw, like, what is this show? It's weird. It was on PBS that looked like it was live television. It didn't look like American television, and they, they talked really funny. Um, but what I eventually learned, and I went to the TV guide, was that this show on PBS was called Doctor Who. And what I had just witnessed was the last five minutes of uh, episode four of Robot, 
which is Tom Baker's first story. I thought I was hooked. My brother, Chris, not hooked. I was hooked. And so in Minnesota, where I grew up, they just showed Tom Baker robots up until I think the Nightmare of Eden. And they showed that like just back to back, back to back, rerun, rerun, reruns for like two years. So it wasn't, I didn't know anything until, because I only saw episode four of Robot. Um, I didn't know that there was a doctor before. I had no idea. And so when I was, in, when we went back to the beginning, I was able to see the first three episodes of Robot. I was like, who's this guy on the floor? I mean, John Pertree. And I was like, wait, so this guy changes faces? This was like into the 80s. It was like 82, 83, 20th anniversary. PBS stations were getting more Doctor Who. And then... I started reading, I started getting magazines and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, there's a new doctor. Is there a new doctor? Is there new, somebody new coming up? Long story short, this new guy comes in. He's good looking. And no offense to Tom Baker, but he's, you know, all teeth. And yeah. anyway, and all teeth. This blonde bombshell who is mysteriously taking over for this quirky guy that I've been following for a while. Just, I knew I was gay before I started watching Doctor Who, but this solidified the fact that I'm like, this guy, I would, I would get into this closet with this guy and travel, travel space and time. That's how I know. And, and, and Peter Davison just brought a kinder, more, I don't know. It was, more, he was more, he was more welcoming. Tom Baker's approach was more very, it was very alien, very, very almost aloof. Um, you saw those those charming, like caring details. Um, you're a beautiful woman, probably. That that line from City of Death. He just he just isn't he didn't act human. But Peter Davison was more. He was I connected more with him, and so he's my doctor. Although I love all the doctors, but yeah, that's my doctor. Long story long. It's a wonderful choice. Uh, uh, you and David Tennant. Yes. Well, he dove do- deep into his like of the fifth doctor and married the doctor's daughter. So yeah, he went very deep. He, he married Peter Davidson's daughter and is now his uh, <laughs> son-in-law. <It's>, yeah. <laughs> Do you know something that's really cool so far? I mean, granted there have only been four uh, people on this show so far, but so far we've had four different doctors, four different answers to that question. Usually I feel like, you know, you would get some, some overlap, but so, uh, what I'm trying to say is I, I think we have a good diversity of opinion here, and that's good for conversation. Um, so let's get into it, guys. Wild Blue Yonder, the second of the 60th anniversary specials. John, overall thoughts? Well, overall, it was a great episode. It was unexpected in what it was. It was actually more of a standalone adventure, and it was one of the scarier type ones not not necessarily just like you know um visual monster scary it was a existential scary episode um that had me sort of like oh they're adventuring together again this wasn't just a you know i assumed three parts it was going to be sort of this will be the tie-in episode that gets you to the final climax part of the story and what we really got was it was an actual episode like a standalone episode of Doctor Who, like it had just been taken from you know uh, their, their 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 seasons together, and I really really had fun with it. Um, and I I don't know something about the way it was done. I felt a little on edge, like oh, yeah. Doctor doesn't entirely know what's happening here. Now he does that a lot. We know that's the trope with the Doctor is he goes, we are so screwed, and then he <laughs> figures it out. But uh, David Tennant in particular, it's like he's actually honed his acting even more. And he can pull off that look of terror and, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen now. Really, really well. And I got that sense, yeah, this doctor doesn't know what's happening. He's just regenerated. His TARDIS is acting weird because, okay, spilling coffee on the controls of the TARDIS, you would think with the incredibly advanced technology and be able to hop out of the universe type thing, you know, they'd have a backup for that. But why put a coffee machine in the TARDIS, in the console? Does happen. But it was also very fitting because, yes, that's a very Donna moment, is that it's not a, you know, something of galactic importance. It's the abundant enthusiasm and like, we have a coffee maker? Yes, let's have some coffee. And then, whoops, 
TARDIS shakes, everything goes to hell. Um, but I had a lot of fun with it. And I, I think we were just saying in the, in, the, in the last podcast, and, and this is what I was really interested in, is, is a Doctor Who has their A story and their B story. The A story is like the monster, is the conflict, and it usually is a monster, or it's, or it's, the, uh, or it's the villain or the master, or whoever it is. And that can oftentimes be goofy, or it can be... It can be scary. Uh, the meep was the goofy one from the previous week. And that's the fun part. And and that's sort of the part that I think is universally accessible uh, to like a, a kid audience. And then the adults can go on and say, well, that was fun. And there's the B story, which is the emotional stuff, the intercharacter interactions, the the emotional development, the character development. And I will say that was really good in this episode. They really, really had moments. And to have it that it was moments that weren't even necessarily real because it was the copy saying it, totally getting you offhand. Like the doctor going, I'm like, oh, I really like your granddad. I really miss him. I really miss him. As you're going between these two scenes where they're both characters and you're like, wait, how can they both be in two places at the same time before you know what's going on? And to have that be both real and unreal at the same time blew my mind. It was like, wow, they're, they're emotionally playing with us, but also the, the story is emotionally playing with its characters and really playing on their emotions. So I, I thought it was good all around, but definitely not what I expected. I expected more of a, I don't know, more of a filler for lack of a better term. I was sort of expecting that for a second of three. So I'm pleasantly Hmm. surprised. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because I've read in some quarters, people were really expecting something a little more, I think, momentous in terms of like, Mm -hmm. because, you know, it's the 60th anniversary. And this episode was the one that had the most secrecy around it. So so people were filling in that void with wild theories about, oh, it's going to be a cameo from Peter Capaldi and Matt Smith. I read that. And now what we see is that the reason they weren't saying anything about this one is because to do so would have ruined the ability to just watch an episode of Doctor Who completely unspoiled and enjoy it that way. Like the secret was there was no secret. I think Radio Times had a um, played into that secret. There's a like cast list redacted, redacted, redacted. So people are like, yes, oh, there's literally, literally people, redacted, like redacted names. Like, whoa, oh, it's got to be Peter Capaldi. Eccleston, maybe even Jody Whitaker or Matt Smith. And I think that, I think this was honestly, it was a great episode. So I watched it. So, so right now I'm in the throes of uh, holiday hoo-ha here in New York. And uh, as a manager of a restaurant, I, my time is very limited. So I knew I just needed to, I needed to get home on Saturday and watch it and then go back, to, you know, go to bed and get up early. But I, I, I just wanted to make sure that I saw it, but I couldn't wait to get home. So I watched it on my phone and I watched it in a restaurant, paused it, watched it in the subway. And as I progressively made my journey home, I'm progressively getting more, more uneasy. This, this, the show was gosh darn, it freaked me out. By the time I got home and it, I stood outside my apartment and finished it. And in New York, there was, there's nobody on the street. It's dark. There's nobody on the street. And I just watched this wild episode. And had this icky feeling in a good way, but it, I've never felt that way with, with Dr. Who, except maybe with Midnight. And I've, I've heard online people are comparing it to like to Midnight and maybe like my comparison would be like Midnight meets the impossible planet, Satan pit and the Ark in space because of the whole, like, you know, it's like kind of, you're on a space, you're in space on a spaceship and it's just the cork cast like for the arc arc in space it's just the fourth doctor harry and sarah and then this monsters revealed and then but the satan pit in the impossible planet you are like it's just got that ickiness and then i kept i kept hearing that like now that we know it was the countdown uh that voice i was like was that uh, gabriel uh what's his name that did the voice of sutek and the uh gabriel's yeah um What's his name? Uh, Bill I want to say Gabriel Byrne, but it's not. It's not <laughs> no. Gabriel Byrne. It's um. um but yeah, it just Wolf? Had very Gabriel. Yeah, Gabriel Wolf. 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 Yeah. But yeah, so I I I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I I like the whole pre-credit sequence with uh, Newton. I do have my bones to pick with the whole gravity matity 
in that I do like the whole, it's very cute, that Mavity, but my view, because of Doctor Who and, and, and Back to the Future and, and whatnot, my view is that Donna should not have been affected by the change of Mavity. She would have slid into a different like a, a universe now where Mavity is the thing and she came from a universe where gravity was the thing. Anyway, that's beside the point, but the gravity Mavity thing, cute. <laughs> Um, but the whole show is awesome. And I didn't mind. I was, I was actually thinking that maybe Matt Smith or Atkinson might come back as evil versions of themselves. Little did I realize it was going to be evil versions of the doctor and Donna. And they just acted the flipping hell out of this show. So I watched it again with my husband and still to right now have this icky feeling about it. I was like, why? And it was like, it just played against what I expected, like uh, a horror trope to be, you know, in that they land and there's this bright, white, clean spaceship corridor, nothing spooky about it, which is what I think that's what's scary, scary because dark darkness, you go into a dark room, you're like, oh, now you can go into a bright room and be like, what? OK, where, what's out there? What's in this bright, clean room that's going to get me? Well, again, it's very much like the Ark in Space. The Ark in Space is the same thing. It's this like bright right. white, you know, space station. Um, no, I felt similarly. The first 20 minutes or so really felt very similar to like the first episode of the Ark in Space. It's just the main cast and they find themselves alone in this spaceship environment. And it's sort of all about exploring what's going on, like where they are and what's going on. And uh, they set up all of these mysteries. Something I thought was really cool was um, the way that Russell set up all of these weird things that didn't really make sense. And you knew, obviously, by the end, you would understand everything. But they were so evocative on their own, the idea that that robot that was taking one step at a time very slowly, and it was like, what is going on here? The voice over the intercom, as you alluded to, was like, okay, and what's that? The thing with the airlock door that had opened three years ago. And it's like, well, what's that about? It was very well crafted, like all of these little mysteries. And one of the things I thought was insanely clever about it was, um, you know, something that Doctor Who does, especially modern Doctor Who, is they turn, the show turns normal everyday things into sources of danger. And I loved the idea that at one point, the source of the danger was the Doctor's own ability to figure out the problem. And he had to, like, literally stop doing what the doctor does in order to save them. Right. And he and he couldn't help it. He was like, no, 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 I have to figure it out. I have to solve it. I can do it. And then he just does it. I thought that was very clever. Yeah, I echo what both of you said. This was unexpected and that it was a standalone adventure. But my God, how well executed, you know, it was kind of like, you know, that movie event horizon it was like mm -hmm. sort of event horizon meets the thing yes yeah yeah and it was just like a very cool some very cool sci-fi ideas some really great performances but john i think you're right it was really the way that that served these amazing character moments one of the things i really loved in that scene that you were talking about where the doctor is talking to shapeshifter Donna, but he doesn't know yet that she's a shapeshifter. He references the flux, the events of the previous season, and we really see how much that affected the doctor. You know, it's almost the the emotional kind of catharsis or emotional fallout, the ramifications on the character of the doctor that um, now I kind of feel like was missing from the flux season at the time. I don't know that I would have singled that out as something that we needed to see, but it was really nice in so many ways, like the maintaining of continuity between the events of the flux and the whole thing with the timeless child from the Jodie Whittaker seasons. And really the thing that Russell T Davies is really so amazing at doing is he always zeroes right in on the, the emotional core of whatever is going on. So he takes these huge sci-fi ideas, these huge larger than life ideas about, you know, changing the doctor's origin story and destroying half the universe. And he makes it this very relatable, very understandable 
very affecting emotional moment. You don't have to have seen all the Timeless Child stuff and know what that is. All you need to know is that the doctor doesn't know where they're from anymore. And you don't need to know what happened with the flux or even what the flux was. Frankly, I don't know what the flux was still. (laughs) But all you need to know is that it was an event that he was involved with that led to mass destruction. And it is really emotional. It's something that the doctor is carrying with them now. And I didn't know that I needed those two things recontextualized in that way. But it's it's what it's what Russell T. Davies, it's what his superpower is. He cuts right to the emotional core of whatever the situation is, whatever the setup is. And he makes the audience care about it. And he brings the audience along on the emotional journey of the characters. And that's, I think, what he's so good at doing. And I almost feel Like it was like Russell T. Davies showing off a little bit. He was like, I am going to emotionally affect you and scare the pants off you. No guest cast. One massive corridor. It's just it's just (laughs) running in a big corridor. You know, no Doctor Who mythos to razzle dazzle you. He was just doing meat and potatoes. Doctor Who extraordinarily. Yes. And I just say that uh, there's there's one moment where the doctor is sitting um, watching Donna and he's, it's the, it's the, the, let's just call it the beta doctor, the, the thing doctor. He made me care about him. He made me care about him. Like when he was talking about Wilf and wanting to see Wilf again, the fact that I knew that it wasn't the real doctor, but I cared about this creature. I cared about this thing that was wearing the doctor's skin and had these memories. And I was like, Dang, I mean, it's a really sweet moment that just kind of like that we didn't get it. We never got it from the uh, the prime doctor, and until the you know at the very end, I thought maybe the the, the monster doctor wanted to see Wilf more than prime doctor. I think he he admitted to it more. I think yeah. that was that was that they really got on with was 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 that uh, you know the doctor had like with the, at, towards the end of the episode when uh, they arrive back in London and there's like the ding you know they're here and uh, Donna says oh conveniently time to get out of awkward conversations you did that deliberately <laughs> you know you know he probably did that was the thing about David Tennant's doctor I mean I keep saying the tenth doctor but now he's the tenth and the fourteenth doctor he's incredibly deep emotionally but has these walls up. And we get the juicy parts when those walls come down. And this was a method in the story to bring the bring those walls down because it wasn't it was him, but it wasn't him. And he wouldn't have had the same control control to be like, no, I'm keeping my defenses up, I'm keeping the walls up, I'm not gonna uh, quite share this. And he still is holding back from Donna. He's still holding back those little bits. What did you go through these last 15 years? Because all of a sudden, Donna's double remembers all of that, Mm -hmm. remembers everything he's been through for 15 years. And these have been a wild and amazing and painful 15 years for the doctor. Actually, thousands of of years. Thousands of years in his time, yeah. I think billions of years. Yeah. Well, well, if you recall- All these uh, things- It depends on heaven sent. It depends on on whether or not he literally lived through that. Or if it was like- Or if it was just like a mind prison- Sort of but thing. it's still it's so much, and 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 this is the way. And again, it it, it is Russell Davies is a writer. It's the people he writes with, um, have a way of communicating these almost incomprehensible things. Whether it's sci-fi concepts, but more more often, emotional experiences, l- life experiences, and conveying them in a way that, as a viewer, I'm I'm feeling them, and relating to them in that moment, and being like, yeah, that's. That's heavy. That's intense. Uh, and not having to have it like not having a flashback or not having a, you know, hey, by the way, this was really intense. Just telling you like it just it just works. It just mm-hmm. you feel like you're sitting there watching and go, oh, man, that was rough. He went through it. He went through it. And that was something that every doctor that's been cast, in my opinion, has been good at. And I will say Jody Whitaker was able to do that, but didn't often enough have the material to do it with. That was the saddest part of those years of Doctor Who was that you had an amazing actor, you had another brilliant doctor, and not quite enough to work with that that gave you the emotional 
side that gave you the the character side um where you felt yeah i really i'm really in this with them as as a viewer and i think a storytellers uh the great storytellers uh make the viewers the readers part of the journey you feel like you know when you when you, when you read a great book and you close that book and you close it and all of a sudden you're like whoa whoa wait i'm back in the real world again you feel almost it's jarring that's what i've been getting from the last two episodes yeah. is, is is a jarring feel when it's done like that oh wait i'm i'm back in the real world again um i went somewhere else didn't i and i didn't even realize it as i was going and i think i told josh this last week the test for me is um do i have my phone or my ipad out during an episode if i do and i'm like oh checking something or there's a game or something whatever then i know i'm not vested i'm not into it and these two episodes i've just been sitting there patient, not having to fight any ADD tendency. It's just like, nope, I'm here. I'm, I'm there for it. And that may be the greatest uh, credit to what they're doing right now. And, and I'm sure that we we have a particular sentimental advantage that, you know, for us, it's going back to a uh, uh, part of the show that means a lot to us. But I think that anyone um, would, would appreciate it to a similar degree. And that's why Wild Blue Yonder had that as an effect, because it was unexpected. It wasn't the grand cameos of some blow our minds. I think they got some tricks up their sleeve for episode three, whatever oh, yeah. they are, whether it's great. But I think storyline wise, and yeah, and that was the end of this episode is, oh, everything is going to hell, literally everything. And nobody knows why. I think, by the way, it has to do with Mavity. <laughs> you know, Ma- I think, I think, they, they 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 messed something up and and now they're gonna be like oh, wait a second <laughs> yeah well let's talk about that the mavity of it all uh do we think that's a throwaway <laughs> gag uh is it a throwaway gag is it something that will be dealt with in the next special and or are people in doctor who just going to be saying mavity for the next 10 years with no explanation <laughs> no it can go either way with that yeah. It really could because the doctor would say gravity and then she would say mavity and then it would be like, oh, wait, wait, wait. And yeah, that was a little confusing. I was like, well, well, why doesn't she, you know, she was in the same TARDIS, everything else. Maybe I'll explain that one away too. Uh, I'm very forgiving of Doctor Who more so than many other shows because they don't have the pretense of trying to literally make everything make sense. They just sort of say, yeah, this is Doctor Who. And you know what? We know that part doesn't make sense. Just go with it. Just go yeah. with it. And we as viewers, we're okay with that generally. Whereas very often, you know, a show like Star Trek, uh, they come up with a lot of techno babble, but they really do try to, you know, do things. And that creates a higher bar and it changes the way you interact with the different shows. Um, and that's something I appreciate about Doctor Who. And I tell people I'm introducing the show to is like, listen, don't get too caught up on whether it entirely makes sense that's not what the show is really about but it does make sense from the character standpoint from the way you go on that journey with them and the emotional standpoint and that's again where the episode worked was that i was there the entire time with those characters through that journey and felt it and i think that's why it's gonna be really difficult when they say goodbye next week you know i'm very excited about this new doctor i'm so casting i'm so excited about russell davies taking a new cast in a new direction but at the same time i i really don't want to say goodbye to the doctor and donna again mm. um this is really something that i didn't expect to ever see again i didn't expect to see yeah catherine tate i didn't expect to see and maybe dave Tennant would have come back you know again you know for, for a cameo i didn't expect to get full episodes and this is such a treat that hasn't disappointed but that it really does show, I think, why we fell in love the first time. I mean, you asked me, my doctor, we didn't say, we said last week, my doctor is David Tennant. But it's a but it's a really tough call because it's a close call with Matt Smith. It's actually really close with Peter Capaldi. Um, I love Eccleston because he brought me into Doctor Who uh, in, in ways that catching it on PBS quite hadn't done it with the earlier doctors. But this was the magic for me. And I went back and I was like, well, I loved Martha. I loved Rose. But it was Donna that really made me just fall in love with them, which is why I think it was so difficult when he said goodbye to her and why it was so fitting that the specials were the 10th Doctor sort of having this lonely journey of his own because that's what we were going through. I think we'd really connected with a character who's no longer going to be there. 
um, lost her memory, lost everything. That was another thing was like, her memory's back. She mm-hmm. is Donna. And the, the one liners, I just remember sitting there watching him like, oh my God, that's Donna again. Oh my God, her witty thing. And how she just calls out the doctor, calls out the circumstances. And then when she demands to drive, I was like, yeah. <laughs> of course you would. It's not even a question. It's like, hey, I'm doing this. Don't don't try to stop. Don't even, you know you're not going to stop me, right? Okay, good. You know, that was something to see back, uh, you know, on screen again. It was just delightful. But also, you know, yeah, Donna's, the, I think, maybe one of the strongest companions because she does not, she is not wowed by the doctor in the same way because she's seen his flaws because she's shared his mind. That's um, true. No, no, that's a good point. It's a really good point. Not only does she share his mind as Dr. Donna for, for that period, but even before that moment, they had that sort of, you know, equal relationship, which means you see the doctor in a different light. Not, not that it's like, super critical it's yeah. that you're you're getting a different perspective and getting to go on the journey in a different way that's a little bit more accessible as a viewer uh like so when peter capaldi comes on he is very distant in the beginning and so he is sort of a throwback to the older doctors um you know up there on a pedestal and david tennant even from the first episode he's a little more down to earth i mean he's sort of thrown down to earth you know um, as is Matt Smith, and he's more accessible. So I wonder if there's a metaphor in mm-hmm. terms of the writing. But I, I as is Jody Whitaker. Yeah, yeah. The woman so, she fell. Know, she fell. Yeah. She fell. Oh yeah. So there's there's something about you know the Doctor being both alien and unknown and accessible at the same time. This episode also did that because with, with that we were talking about earlier, the expression of fear when the TARDIS leaves, and he doesn't know why. I realize oh, the sonic screwdriver's in the keyhole. So what's he left with? But that's also when we as viewers know we're in for an adventure. They're going to have to figure their way out of it, not just call on superpowers. Which the whole the whole keyhole thing kind of like made me stop and pause because wasn't it in the sensorites? I mean, I don't know, this is going back to the very first Doctor. The whole key lock mechanism was stolen and, and he was the, the you know, first Doctor freaking out ah, it's inaccessible we can't we'll never be able to get into it uh, i don't know i just it harkened back it brought me back to there i was like why is she why is she ripping up a key lock mechanism anyway well you know one of the other things about doctor who similar to how you know the rules of time travel and science you can't you can't take that seriously the mechanics of the tardis have never been consistent sure. how the tardis works has never like um my favorite is i think it's in planet of the daleks when there's that thing that's like growing on the outside of the tardis and john pertwee is like oh no we're gonna suffocate oh right like it's like (laughs) it's like you're gonna like wait and then i think it's a tiny vent on the outside that lets in air yeah (laughs) from space yes right yeah exactly (laughs) um so yeah so the so the way the tardis works the thing about it is that because it's time travel you kind of can rationalize it as being like okay well whatever you're seeing right now is true right then but that doesn't mean that it was ever always wrong true when it was some other way before well, yeah and didn't he talk about that with the had system yeah you know like, oh well that was always on but now it's not basically because of like this regeneration or that they flipped it back on it was it was it was sort of like unclear but he was saying yep it's different now i interpret it to be that he was using a sonic to accelerate the regeneration process whether it was like mm. the energy from the sonic screwdriver or whatever it was able to do, but it was sort of like, let's get this regenerated real fast. It'll be fine. I also kind of laughed uh, because like, I imagine that that's a problem that every, it's like the first problem that every writer sitting down to write their Doctor Who has to figure out, okay, how do we get rid of the TARDIS and how do we get rid of the sonic screwdriver? Yep. Uh, because <laughs> because no you matter gotta what- Got to get rid of the superpowers. Yeah, because no matter what jeopardy I create here, I need a reason why they don't just hop in the TARDIS and leave. I read unrelated Doctor Who that uh, uh, they they always wrote that in the X-Men movies, that they always had to take Professor X out in the first act so that he couldn't use his amazing powers to basically solve the day. So people are always upset because like, where's Patrick Stewart? Like, we're only getting him for like the first act and then the end of, of the movie. And that was sort of disappointing. But it, it, it's something you almost need to do if you're dealing with something that is so godlike like a tardis you know otherwise yeah. it's just sort of like yeah, let's go to the tardis and solve the problem um 
And this was, and this left us with a terror and the terror of nothingness. I wanted to, but like the idea of it, which again is very timey wimey, like they're outside the universe, but not is like, oh, you'll discover that. And you'll discover this. This is, this is possible. You can be outside the universe, but you're not, but you are. And it's like, oh, okay. Great way of just sort of waving that, waving that away. But that nothingness is also not nothingness. And here's everything from the universe, which apparently it's not just our planet, our group of planets, or our galaxy. The universe has a real problem with people being angry and warlike. And that was an interesting point that like these things coming from nothing into shape were taking the essentially the, the psychic TV signals coming from mm-hmm. the universe. They could have written it like the galaxy as well, but you know, same, same idea is that it's coming out from four and they're just like, yeah. We're, we're shaping around that. But that leaves me with my question, which is that that all said that they were highly influenced by the negativity coming from the conflict of our universe. If they were to 100%, he said he got the 99.9% copy of Donna and where they were close to copying the doctor. But hypothetically, if they had copied them completely, wouldn't they have taken their entire perspective, their entire experience, their entire lived view? And, and their emotions. Like, oh, yeah. Wait a Good second. Point. It's it's very much the uh, the way uh, Data defeats Lore and Picard. You know, he's like, yes, take all my memories, take everything I am. And therefore, it gives you that, oh, oh, there's more than just my villainous intent or or, or the negative uh, senses I got from the universe because the doctor gets that all the time. And he's, you know, where I loved it in Torchwood when he doesn't show up in Children of Earth and they say why. Is that they think that sometimes the doctor just looks at humanity and is so disappointed in us that he won't come that time, you know. He won't rescue us from everything. And, and that's a profound statement because the doctor does see the worst of us and has to has to cope with that and that's that's just really intense and tragic in its own way that he he internalizes all that and then going back to this there david Tennant is keeping his walls up not sharing it because you know he's been through it but he's also viewing humanity from that lens and how does he do it um and i think there's going to be some sort of moment in episode three where we're going to get a big like burst of something it's on the 14th doctor as to what he's been through, what he is now, what his relationship to humanity is, you know, and his humanity, which talking about the, the TV, uh, a special that aired with Paul McGann, all of a sudden he has a human mother and you're like, wait a second. Um, well, yeah, there's a humanity to the doctor that, that really, they nailed in this one. And what did you, what did you all think of the idea that it was like, they, they just took a concept. It was nothingness, something coming from nothingness, and then the nothingness having trouble adapting to slow, like the concept of slow. Like that, that I thought that was just brilliant because it was something I never ever thought about as both a storyline, but also as an alien type thing. And it was classic Russell Davies, and then it was like, you know, something's off, and then there's the line. My arms are too long. My arms are too long. <laughs> what does that mean? What? Yeah. Yeah. How? And they're not showing you. They're just, they just say it. And you're like, all right, well, no, I bet her arms, my arms, well, are, her arms are really long. <laughs> I was not expecting a really <laughs> not giant not that thing. Long. I was like, that whoa, was- okay. Oh. okay. <laughs> the idea of something coming from nothing to me, I think is a very evocative idea, especially because the universe is weird. And one of those things that, is sort of the eternal question at the heart of, you know, physics and really all of science is like, how did something come from nothing? I was thinking that was like a swirling mass of stuff that kind of coalesced in. Yeah. And then started, sort of traveling toward that, which was attracting it. I did. It's very, I mean, it's very nebulous. It's very, you know, no, totally. Yeah. Like I think, um, you know, sort of like an antenna will, will pick up radio signals, right? It's sort of like we are, we meaning like intelligent life and our emotions and our psychic energy and and what have you, we are sending out these signals into the ether. And the thing it actually reminded me of is, um, I forget, uh, there's this experiment that was conducted where 
a scientist took the elements that were present in the atmosphere and on uh, primordial Earth, put it in a closed test tube, and then subjected it to bursts of electricity simulating lightning storms. And eventually, it spontaneously created amino acids. So there's this self-organizing principle that certain things will form from nothing given the right conditions. So this idea that the psychic energy that we are putting out into the ether would make something manifest from nothing kind of makes some kind of sense in a very abstract way. I mean, the only way you can talk about these things is in a very abstract way. The other thing, though, that I love about the whole notion of these creatures are the product of all of the hate and war and everything from life in the universe is that, again, it's very Russell T. Davies to me. He has this like nihilistic streak, this like jaded streak. It's like I always remember the um, Toclophane at the end of mm -hmm. series three where it's like, so you're saying the ultimate fate of humanity is to turn into these disembodied heads in metal cases that will return to the 21st century and destroy humanity. Like, that's very dark. <laughs> like, it's not very dark. dark. And then in the very first episode of Torchwood, where they use the glove that can revive somebody who died for like five minutes or something. And the first time they use it, the dead man, he wakes up and he's he's horrified. He's like, there's nothing. There's nothing. Right. Russell T. Davies has this um, bleak view of humanity, I think. And he never says that goodness and beauty isn't also there. But I think he, he thinks baseline humanity is is pretty dark. And I think that that comes through a lot in his like, you know, Midnight, like you referred to earlier, it's a brilliant episode. Oh, but it's all about how humans are really just terrified monkeys that will uh, you know, return to their baser instincts. Yeah. Uh, so for me, that was very of a piece with Russell Davies' other work. Isn't that the most interesting thing, though, about everything? And because you think of a, of a writer looking at it and saying, you know, OK, human beings are monkeys that just get scared and react as such. But then we're literally writing this stuff. We're writing these grand stories or writing about the doctor or writing about the potential of humanity, the nihilism of humanity, all of that. And it, and it always blows my mind because that's, that's always the greatest sci-fi is that it takes these concepts. But then you realize when you zoom out from the process of actually just making the television show, what goes into that, then the vision and the creativity, the, the notions, well, what are we all about? Like, and, and that's something we can like go on forever about. Well, what are we about? Are we just the nothingness? Um, are we just the, the the monkeys? But yet we can conceive of this crazy stuff happening in this but, show. And, and, and this but he talks about it. The, the, the doctor mentions that Donna can hold two independent ideas diametrically opposite of each other yeah. and hold them to be true at the same time. I was talking to somebody right after the episode, that notion of humanity. Yeah two different minds, which explains so much of our current state in the world where we can literally hold those two things as contradictory. And the doctor pointing that out and being like, yeah, that's that's a weird human quality that all of you can do. And there we are. The very show is the manifestation of that. Um, Russell Davies is so interesting because his pre years and years had this sort of nihilistic view to it uh, with some hope as well. Just this sort of like sense of like, yeah, we're going to go through it before it gets better. Then we're going to screw it up again. And it, it's sort of, you know, rinse and repeat a bit. And Doctor Who's storylines do that. It's like, oh, the great, this is the best of humanity. It's like the fifth empire or something. Uh, I always remember that from the early years. And then it's like, yeah, and then they mess it all up all over again. And they sort of restart. I think that's the writer's own like duality of like, yeah, we're gonna do these amazing things, but we're also really awful, but we're gonna do these amazing things. So like, where, where does it shake out? The yeah, doctor, I mean, these that happen over and over again. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to, I think to be a writer worth anything, you can't shy away, you can't look away from the horrific realities that do exist. But at the same time, I think you have to, also have the vision to see 
the beauty and the wonder that is also there because otherwise you, you wouldn't be writing like i think yeah, you know not yeah. to get not to get grandiose about it but it's sort of like the exercise of making doctor who is the antidote to the nihilism yeah almost it's it's sort of like you need a you need a vessel to bring the beauty into sharper relief and yeah and i think i think guy is exactly right you need to be able to hold those two opposing ideas and believe them both to be true at the same time. Yeah. And I think, I think that's a little of the authorial voice slipping in to Donna's or the doctor's mouth. I think that that is literally true of, of Russell T Davies. I know we're all going to be sad to see 14 and Donna say their goodbyes next week, but, but I are am they? ready for, well, yes, right. But are they to us? But are they? <laughs> okay, fair enough. And there, there are many more anniversaries to come. Yeah. Well, I've, I've but I am ready. I am ready for we'll some. Talk about that later. No, I've also heard spoilers. I I'll believe it when I see it. I haven't heard any. I've somehow avoided spoilers. I didn't even know. You know, this is going to be a multi-episode thing. I I I'd, I'd kept my my expectations low. I'm, I was just like, I don't want to know anything. I don't want to build up to it. So I didn't even know about the redacted stuff. But I did for some reason have it in the back of my mind that Wilf was going to make an appearance. Like, I, I don't know why I had that. And maybe it's because I had read about Bernard Crippen's death in 2022 yeah. and something triggered with that. But that was that was one thing I, I did. I, I did a hope and I end. Getting that at the end was such a treat. I, I don't think I realized until I saw him on screen last night what he meant to me as a character. Because they really, they really get here like the emotional beats. They really set it up well in episode one last week, where they they show the the difference between Donna's relationship with her mother now and previously. That it, it was similarly contentious and difficult, and, and and really not entirely healthy. But now it was because her mother was trying to protect her from remembering who she was because that would kill her because she could not take the memories of being a time lord. But when Donna had her first run as as a companion, her relationship with her mother was this was was really a difficult one to portray on screen. It was it was a bad relationship. Her mother was not supportive, was not kind to her. And her grandfather was the one who was the supportive one. Uh, uh, went along for some of the adventures and showed this sort of unconditional love for his grandchild. And that was something that I didn't realize I missed so much. And when we see him, the door to the TARDIS open, and you just see him sitting there, you know, having waited for the doctor. I don't know. It all came flooding right back in a second. And whether that was my state of mind or just the way that he captures that role as an actor or that the director did, I was just right back there. And it had a huge emotional impact to me. I was like, you know, I tears my eyes. I was like, this is... It's like Wolf is back. Like Bernard Cribbins is back on TV. And there he is being like, Doctor, it's all gone to hell, you know. But you also <laughs> knew that he was the one sitting there. He was the one waiting. He's there for you. He was there for Donna in, in, in a way that nobody else was. And the doctor knew that. You know, I think that's why he had a particular, you know, love for that him as a character. You know, was was that, oh yeah, he's there for everybody. Um, and so we were left, even with a very brief cameo, this huge emotional impact. Um, if you if you knew who this character was, otherwise it would be a, a nice little thing that happened. But I think for the rest of us who've you know watched the previous series, that was a huge moment. That was a huge experience, even though it was only forty five seconds or a minute and a half or something like that. And, and I didn't that know it was going to be that short. I thought yeah. it was going to be into the next episode. I I honestly. I didn't get overwhelmed until after I I turned the TV off and I then I went to the the boards. I don't know why I thought he was going to be in the next episode. I didn't think he would be in in the second episode. I thought he was actually going to be more of a, a substantial part in the giggle and and that's that's it. What we saw and that's when I I actually cried. That was sad. I was like, that's it. Yeah. That's well, that's Wilf, and that's yeah. According to Russell T. Davies on Instagram, there were more scenes that they had written that uh, they weren't able to film with him, but that they got 
this one and that on its own, I think if that's all there is, it's still amazing. It's still amazing. It's still it's still wonderful that he was able to be in these specials at all and that we got that, you know, mini reunion. I actually wanted to comment, Guy, the way you watched the show. I totally understand not being able to wait. I personally probably would have waited until I was near a decent sized TV that was <laughs> larger than my phone. But that's just me. But something you reminded me of is like, so on the West Coast, the specials drop on Disney Plus at 1030 a.m. And it's very Lucky. hard for me. Well, it's very hard to resist watching because I do feel very strongly that Doctor Who should be watched at night when it's dark outside. Huh. Interesting. And I was watching this episode. I couldn't resist. I watched it when it was bright sunshine outside. And immediately I was like, oh, I, sh I really should have waited to watch this one because it was so creepy and so atmospheric that yeah. I was like, this would have been great watching it with the lights off at night. I had intended to wait, but, you know, my daughter was asleep and I didn't have anything to do. And I knew, I mean, it was right there. So I was just like, ah, I'll just watch it. And I'm sure I'm going to do the same thing this weekend with the giggle. But um, Wild Blue Yonder, the song that the TARDIS played, do you think that's just a little bit of poetic whimsy or do you think it has more significance? Are we going to see it again? Are we going to hear it again? Or is it just it was what it I was? I won't be surprised. I won't be surprised if we see it again. And it could be that it is a little bit of whimsy. So I'm actually be I'm able to hold in my head to posing ideas that we will see it again and we possibly won't. And if either happens, I'll be okay with that. Same. I, I love the way I love the theory. way you put it there because yeah, it, it, it could be either or. Isn't that the theme of the Air Force? Yeah. So that was that was for Wilford Mott. Wasn't he wasn't he Air Force? So it it it, it linked in a whole bunch of ways that I found uh interesting. And I I just get the sense with this that they they don't do things without reason. We may not hear the song again, but the concept behind it is a it, it, it sounds uplifting, but it's really about the horrors of war as well, which is why well, and, also, and they mentioned that in the episode. This is like not you know, yeah. we'll, we'll be singing that. So I think that's where we're going with the next episode. Is that that's also the Doctor's journey with the companions? Is that it's you're going off for the wild blue yonder? There's this enthusiasm. There's this like. And, and, and a, like a, a chorus behind you. And then there's also the reality of it and what you're, all, what you're also going to face and, and the hardship, the pain, the loss, because that's something Doctor Who does. Russell P. Davies came out and said that this was but I'm probably not a good episode for children. Like that song is not a good episode for children to sing. I mean, it sounds sweet. And Donna's choir teacher made them sing it and i'm sure it was very you know it's a very uplifting whatever but it's a it's a marching going off to war song just kind of like this episode it's like it's I, I as an adult this is the first doctor who story episode that i i actually was basically like disturbed by i can't imagine seeing it at age 11 and a half yeah no it is quite frightening and unnerving in a very creepy moody atmospheric way um yeah you know i was never at an age like i've never seen any doctor who at an age where it really scared me which uh i think is both a good and a bad thing i think there is something about the things that we watched and read when we were young that kind of scarred us and imprinted themselves on our psyches but then again, like I was a scared little kid. So if Doctor Who scared me as a kid, I probably wouldn't have have kept watching it. So so I think I'm watching it at the age appropriate time for me personally. But OK, next week we have chaos. We have the toy maker. We have Neil Patrick Harris. We're going to see Shudi Gatwa. And, you know, John, you were saying we are going to be sad to say goodbye to 14 and Donna. But I'm ready for some Shudi Gatwa. I'm very excited for his debut, his official debut as the Doctor next week, if you don't count the <clears throat> filmed cameo for the new version of An Adventure in Space and Time from a couple weeks ago. I don't count that. No, yeah, <laughs> no, it's it's a... I'm really excited. <laughs> Do either of you have any expectations going into next week? After this week, I don't really know what to expect because this week was such a surprise. Uh, it, it was a surprise in terms of style, in terms of 
it being a standalone episode. So I really don't know what's going to happen. I think it's going to be, this is going to be a bigger one and it will be a goodbye episode of a sort. Here's my one prediction about the tone of the episode. I don't think it's going to have the tragic goodbye and sense of loss that the first goodbye to Donna Noble had and that David Tennant's first regeneration had into Matt Smith. Uh, that was the, I don't want to go. That was Donna Noble losing all the things we had just experienced with her as viewers. That I don't think we're going to experience the same way. I, and I don't think Davies is here to to like, you know, double punch us for that. I think it's meant to be more um, <laughs> a bit of closure, but a bit of also like, yeah, we, we, we've brought back something. Now let's get you ready for the next adventure. And I, and that's what I want him to pull off. And then if anything has to be pulled off in the next episode, it has to be a fond, bittersweet farewell that gets us ready for the next chapter in this adventure. That's that. That's what I hope from it. I hope they, they answer the question that's been repeat, asked a few times. Why this face? I'm expecting an answer. Yeah. yeah. Or, you know, why this face? I'm also, I won't be surprised if this whole thing from the regeneration from 13 to 14 isn't uh, some kind of manipulation from the toy maker, uh, in some sense. And, um, mm -hmm. maybe the, the star beast, you know, the beep, yeah. the meep, beep, the meep, you know, a little comment at the end saying the boss about what something about the boss is the toy maker. Maybe that's, I don't know. I want that answer though. I want that question answered. Why the space? Yeah. Is the boss, the toy maker? And I'm very interested in learning why the doctor has this same face again. Well, we shall see. Um, we shall see in a, in a few very short days. I'm so excited that uh, we have all this new Doctor Who dropping in our laps for Christmas. It's so lovely. But anyway, I want to thank both John and Guy for facilitating this discussion about Wild Blue Yonder. And I still don't have a sign off for this show, but I hope you all enjoy whatever comes next. See you next time. <laughs> See you next week. Ciao, guys. <laughs>